All right, so we are live, Pat. Hi, Allison. How are you? Hi. I'm doing well. Thank you so much for taking time this afternoon to talk about your exhibition that's at SVAC right now called Choices. Um, before we begin, I'll just quickly introduce myself. My name is Allison Kreitz. I'm the manager of exhibitions and interpretive engagement. And it is my great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, artist Pat Music. Uh, Pat's music at SVAC, sorry, Pat's exhibition at SVAC is called Choices. This exhibition explores the beauty and fragility of our planet, and by extension, the choices that we humans make that impact not only the health of the earth, but also our own physical, mental, and even spiritual well being. And I will pull up um, the presentation right now so people can look at um, some images of your artwork while I'm talking. Okay. So Pat has been a professional artist for over 50 years. She attended the University of Southern California on an art scholarship and received a master's and a PhD from Cornell University. Pat taught at the university level for 25 years and also found time to author four books on art. Her work consists of both large and small scale sculpture and two dimensional art. And she often uses natural media, such as wood, stone, paper, and beeswax. Pat's work is in over 100 public and private collections in the United States, Canada, Mexico, and Europe, including many prestigious art museums, such as the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Arkansas, the Toledo Museum of Art in Ohio, and Grounds for Sculpture, an incredible sculpture park and arboretum in New Jersey. Pat first heard about SVAC from one of her most important art teachers, whose name was Paul Sample, whom she studied with at Dartmouth during the 50s and 60s. Although she didn't exhibit her artwork at SVAC at that time, Pat recalled that Sample, who was an acclaimed, acclaimed New England regionalist, was very involved with SVAC. Her relationship with the organization began many decades later in the mid 2000s when she moved to Manchester after retiring from teaching. And Pat told me that she immediately felt a connection with SVAC's physical facilities and natural setting, as well as our history of building strong relationships with artists and institutions in the region. Around this time, she offered, um, just excuse me one moment, my slides are not moving, there we go. So around this time she offered a piece of outdoor sculpture called Crossing for our permanent collection, which as you can see here in this image sits beautifully across a small stream on our property. In 2009, she had an exhibition in Yester House called From the Forest. And in 2015, we hosted her exhibition, Our Fragile Home in the Wilson Museum. Pat has also generously loaned us another piece for our sculpture park called Gatekeepers. This one is prominently located on our lower campus and is one of the first sculptures that greets visitors on the way up the hill. This fall in conjunction with Pat's exhibition, we partnered with Artichoke Dance Company who delivered an incredible outdoor performance. You may not be able to tell from these photographs, but the dancers' costumes are made entirely out of post-consumer plastics. And the company was founded with a mission to use dance as a vehicle through which to address climate change, which made for a perfect complement to Pat's exhibition. Before I turn things over to her, I'd like to take a few more minutes to show you a couple of installation shots from her current exhibition. This first image is taken from the entrance to the gallery and shows the first object that greets visitors as they move into the room. This is one of four sky dancer pieces in the show that Pat will talk about further in her remarks. I'd also like to point out the enormous eye-catching piece that looks like the sun on the back wall of the gallery, drawing people further into the gallery. I like to imagine that it's there casting warmth and generative light on all the visitors who spend time in this space. In this next image, you'll get a different perspective of the gallery. 
The two images on the left are part of a series of drawings that Pat made in the 60s that evoke abstracted wintry landscapes. Also point out here that the artwork is grouped by season in this exhibition. So here in the foreground, those two images are part of the winter section. Moving to the right, there's a large piece that incorporates a metal frame in the shape of an arch that anchors the spring section. To the right of that piece are objects that form summer. And then in this last image are four collages depicting autumn trees full of movement. And this work in particular brings up the idea of seriality or repetition that is common in Pat's work. The last thing I'd like to point out is another special and unique aspect of this exhibition, which is the inclusion of labels written by members of our community in response to Pat's work. The image on the right is of Alice Wolf Gilborn, who is a poet who lives in East Dorset, and she's standing in front of the text she wrote about the Sky Dancer series. We had 11 community members from a range of backgrounds, including a high school student with a passion for environmental advocacy, a retired systems analyst who was also a founding board member of the Battenkill Watershed Alliance, and a state legislator who was a member of the Climate Solutions Caucus. The images on the left were taken during our workshops. During our first session, we looked at images of all the artwork together and shared our initial impressions, reactions, and interpretations. And during the second session, we worked with the writer Megan Mayhew Bergman, who lives locally. Megan led the group through some writing exercises and provided critical guidance on how to shape and edit our own writing. The end results were incredibly profound and have deeply enriched the overall story and experience that this exhibition offers our visitors. And to give you a taste of some of what our participants had to say about Pat's work, I pulled a few excerpts from some of their labels, which you see here on the slide. And I'll just take a moment to read these. So the first one is from Els Van Wart, who said, Sky Dancers evokes so much for me, the complexities of our relationships with creatures such as birds and fish and their magnificence. I know in my bones that I am part of and not outside of these life forms. My kind co-evolved with theirs and we are kin. The art calls me to direct my attention towards these and other life forms, beings that require our full presence to truly see and that are so worthy of our marveling, protecting, and restoring. The second quote comes from Bonnie Levis, who wrote, when I first saw the piece's sources, I was a little confused and a little bit disgusted, but the title of the piece lends itself to the idea that this creepy organism is life-giving to be celebrated. What could be more important than the source? And then lastly, community contributor Matt Croft said about the sculpture Commence, that it immediately started my mind churning as it captured so much meaning for what my life has revolved around. Mineral and wood forms erupting from the soil. Everything that sustains us is derived from the soil and everything eventually returns to the soil again. Um, so I think with, with that, Pat, I will turn things over to you uh, for you to talk about um, your works of art in the exhibition, and then we might have time for some questions after. Thank you, Allison. Um, and I wish also to thank SBAC for this wonderful opportunity to share my work with the larger community in this beautiful museum um, and gallery space. Uh, it, it is so large and airy and free and is such a compliment to the, the theme that has consumed me for the last 30 or 40 years. So thank you very much for, for the opportunity. Um, let's have the first slide, Allison. Uh, the ego plays uh, an enormous um, part in, uh, in my oeuvre. Uh, you see on the left uh, a close-up of the painting surface of the abstract eagles uh, that are portrayed on the right. They're involved in a mating dance. Um, I 
sat on uh, the large outdoor deck of our property in Northwest Arkansas the first uh, December and January that we lived there and uh, became aware of a large shadow moving, uh, sort of swooping up and down uh, over my head uh, and projected onto the deck of, of uh, on which I was sitting. And I looked for uh, what was causing this phenomenon and located in the sky above me a pair of eagles uh, doing a uh, what I assumed was a mating dance, um, although I'm not sure the season was right. Um, swooping in the sky with this great graceful arches uh, and and arcs of movement. Um, I was absolutely amazed at how close they were. But then I realized that our house was perched on a 200 foot cliff overlooking a valley. And that if their uh, roosts or nests were located in the tops of those cliffs, which was, I think, a good assumption, um, they were flying at cliff top level instead of 50 or 100 feet above that. And that was where they were catching the thermals and, and that allowed them to move in these large swoops. Um, I was so intrigued by, by them and so overjoyed uh, when the next day more appeared and there would be more and more to come. Um, I some days could count up to 20 of them circling just 25 feet above my head, um, so full of power and, and so full of grace. So the eagle became um, an archetype for me um, that, that spoke of the power of the generation of the planet. And uh, you will see the eagle in many, many forms um, in my complete body of work. Uh, next slide, Allison. These are three of the eagles and their colors represent uh, the seasons. When I was invited to, uh, to do this show and uh, began to make selections to recommend to Allison to curate from, I thought of uh, portraying the four seasons, which is uh, a theme that recurs over and over again uh, over the years in, in my work. Here on the left, we see summer and the warm yellows um, and that project uh, heat. Um, the, the, the eagles are portrayed in in uh, a, a moment of intense um, uh, heat. In the middle, we have spring and spring is portrayed in blue, representing uh, the burst of the blue sky that occurs after many long gray days of, of winter and of, of which uh, is portrayed on the far right. Uh, the somber grays uh, uh, with some muted uh, warmth in them, uh, representing those rare days that, that sparkle with uh, a portend of uh, the future spring and then summer. These um, vitrines that that the eagles are located in were important in the design of the piece. They were inspired by some of the work I saw in Japan um, uh, on a trip that Jerry, my husband Jerry Carr, uh, and I made. And um, uh, it was a combination of lightness and heaviness uh, that was so successful in uh, Japanese art, juxtaposed, juxtaposing those two 
elements. Uh, the vitrines are closed at the top and the bottom by heavy uh, uh, boards, uh, they're oak boards. And uh, the images are encased in a plexiglass uh, that, that is projected about five inches away from the eagles, but they're open on the sides. Um, you can stand at the side of the base and peek into uh, a, a, a vision uh, that is both mysterious and open. And it's that openness that's important. I had the feeling that I did not want to contain these gorgeous uh, beasts, and I wanted them to be able to fly free. And so I left the sides of the vitrines open for them to explore the world at large. And I love imagining the gallery at night with no one in it and no lighting, and the eagles suddenly find their way out to freedom. Next slide. This uh, piece is called Commence, and she too is part of the spring uh, season. I say she because for me, she's um, the prototype of the female figure. Uh, I see her as a tall abstraction of uh, a pregnant woman carrying the commencing of life within her like very much like the eagles about to escape and fly uh, into the, the freedom of their existence. Uh, the piece of wood from which this bronze was cast was a gift from um, a, a basket maker friend of mine in Northwest Arkansas, whose land had been torn apart by a tornado a swath of uh, his farmland was leveled uh, and on that had been many beautiful big oak trees. And he had, uh, invited me to come and see if there were, was any wood that I would like to have to use in making my art, uh, which later on turned out to be very, uh, very fortuitous. But one day he drove up in his truck to my studio and got out with this huge piece of wood. It's about nine feet tall and said, I just know you're going to do something with this. Uh, and I said, yes, I am. And commence began to emerge. Um, I left her in a wood form for probably five years and then discovered uh, that some little critters uh, were enjoying uh, her body and beginning to nest and also to partake. And I realized I was going to lose her. And at that point, I would, had just been awarded um, a, a, a artist grant from the Arkansas Arts Council. And I took my check and my piece of wood uh, to my favorite um, uh, foundry and asked him to cast her in bronze. Uh, the patina that he get, was able to produce on this piece can be seen in the uh, image to the far right. Uh, it's a beautiful combination of the sky, sky blues and the browns of the forest floor and has the kind of mottled feeling of leaves um, that have fallen to the, to the ground in the forest. Next slide, please. Epilogue six uh, was a very important part of, uh, of my creative evolution. Um, up until the 1990s, I had been dealing 
mainly with the, the uh, human as uh, my subject matter. And um, I began uh, as, well, I began with my children and I it did when I studied with Paul Semple, I was doing a lot of uh, studies of my children in various parts of their life and their lives. And as uh, they began to grow, I, I began looking for other subject matter. And at that time we had moved to Northwest Arkansas to the woods of the Ozarks. And it was a very uh, remote section of the state. Uh, there were no other properties around except a mile down the river, uh, another house up on the opposite side of the cliff. Um, the first year that we lived there, we were hit by a major uh, storm. Uh, it was called a 30-year flood, and the river moved up into uh, the woodlands and, and the, the fields and totally destroyed the uh, underground and growth. Um, and a lot of uh, trees were felled from the strength of the, of the flood. And uh, following that, a forest fire occurred and about 200 acres very close to us was totally destroyed. Um, and turned, the earth was turned into ash. And um, I, I despaired uh, for, for the beauty of this land that, that surrounded us. Uh, I, I could not imagine that it would recover. And, um, and it was a very tragic sort of winter that we passed through. But when spring came, I was amazed to find little shoots of green coming up out of the earth and new life and new birth, uh, new growth was more beautiful, healthier, stronger than it had been before. And so I knew that I wanted to do a series on this subject. Uh, I did 25 of these pieces, which are quite large. Um, this is nine feet in width and uh, about nine and a half feet tall. Um, I called the series Epilogue, the aftermath to the storm or the disaster. Um, and here you see uh, the, the pink uh, horizontals um, and the rough textured pink and gold parts of the piece um, representing this new life, this new spirit and, and growth. Um, and there are also a metaphor for those times in our, our lives that we experience the opportunity for new change, often following a personal disaster, uh, new growth, uh, new joy and happiness. Um, the frame in front of it is um, found in many of the pieces in the series uh, in one form or another. And for me, it's um, the gate uh, that you must open and walk through in order to find the new growth, whether it's in your forest uh, or in the forest of your personal life. Um, the piece, the um, image on the right gives you a close up of uh, the materials that I used in this. Uh, series, uh, I was looking for something that would reflect stone, but I wanted to design the shape of an, or form of, that it would take. And so it uh, turned out to be a casting into a sand table um, of a material called hydrocal. This is similar to uh, casting a cement sidewalk. Um, but the material is more durable, it's hard, harder, it does um, 
uh, not damage as easily as uh, your concrete that we're all used to in our world. Um, next slide, Allison. Uh, this piece is also part of the spring section in the exhibit. Um, it's uh, called Dogwood Dancings. I did uh, a series of um, about seven um, of uh, the dogwoods in the early spring. They were so uh, dominant in the forests of Northwest Arkansas. And one of the first flowering uh, of life that you see in the spring, an absolutely beautiful form which I decided to, in this case, to abstract. Um, the, the piece is one that um, I look for the response of the reviewer. Well, I actually do that in all of my work, but particularly in one as abstract as, as this. Um, and, and I've, been very lucky that uh, most of the pieces in this series have found their ways into various private homes and private collections. Next slide, please. Uh, the, this uh, is a shot of raw, which Allison discussed uh, briefly. <clears throat> Uh, Ra is the name that the ancient Egyptians gave to their sun god. And uh, at, at this point, I had finished the eagle series and had moved into uh, gods and goddesses. Uh, I am kind of a history nut, and I believe in the, the importance of our looking at history as well as looking at the future and the present um, in, in making our life decisions. Uh, there was much wisdom, much beauty, much power and strength to be found in ancient cultures and much uh, reasonable direction to, uh, to ponder. Um, I have have um, completed a, a series I call Continuum that looks at uh, the similarities in uh, life events between the Mesopotamian culture and our culture of uh, the 1960s and 70s um, and, and have for a long time uh, followed uh, uh, that muse of, uh, of studying the ancients. So Ra is part of a series of about, um, I think I did uh, 35 um, studies of various um, uh, ancient cultures. Uh, the sticks that you see that form the rays of the sun uh, came from that basket maker's farm that I told you about. And Jerry and I went out when he invited us to harvest uh, what we wanted. And uh, I was able to make this collection of, of sticks. Um, I sanded them. I, well, I uh, uh, first of all scraped the bark off of them and sanded them four times and then wax them with a paste wax to get the, the glow that I feel emulates the, the rays um, of the sun. Um, the two small pieces on the right are pictured on the left of the sun. Uh, and these are, are despite the uh, creepy animal that, that the community member saw in them. And that's perfectly fine. Um, I want people to interpret them in their own way, in their own person. Um, 
Despite that fact, though, they are solar flares, um, and, and they relate very closely to those wooden rays in Ra. Um, it's kind of interesting. I don't know how many people know that uh, the heat of the sun is not in, in the, the central disk, which you would, th would think it would be concentrated there and then dissipate as the rays move out into space. <laughs> Actually, at the end of the, the solar flare is the highest heat that is found in, uh, in the sun. Um, my husband, Jerry Carr, who was an astronaut um, and commander of the Skylab 4 84-day mission, studied the sun and um, has, he was, um, Jerry was a very important source for me in, in uh, my work and helped me in many ways to enlarge it. Not only did he, upon retirement, uh, help construct larger and larger visions, uh, but he gave me larger and larger content to think about um, and, and to incorporate. Next slide, Allison. Ah, raw. <laughs> Here you see uh, the sun's rays, which as I, I said, were uh, my version of solar flares. Um, and at the uh, right of it, uh, a close-up. Uh, many people uh, like to try to walk to the side of this piece also, uh, as they did to the eagles in the vitrines, uh, and see how it's put together. It's actually put together in eight sections of rays, uh, and they are constructed like a fan that you would hold in your hand. Uh, and they are, they have a, a catch on the back of the round disc where, where they slip into and are, are screwed tight for the exhibit, but it comes apart. It's modular um, and, and um, easy to transport. This piece is nine feet, nine and a half feet in diameter. Next slide, please. And now we, we move from summer into fall. And the fall of uh, these tree collages, um, they came about when Jerry and I were in Northwest Arkansas. We had driven down from uh, Vermont uh, to install a, a large uh, stone piece at the Crystal Bridges of American Art in their sculpture garden. And they, we stayed uh, in a hotel that every morning we walked out the front door and right beside uh, our car, where our car was to be parked, was this beautiful tree beginning to drop its very colorful, bright uh, fall leaves to the ground. Um, I fell in love with that tree over the 10 day period that we were there uh, installing and knew that by the time I got home, knew that I was going to do a, a series of fall trees. Um, Jerry and I drove around uh, New Hampshire and Vermont, upstate New York, photographing trees and uh, then I took those back to my studio and enlarged them and used them as, uh, as models for uh, this series. I call this series uh, the instant of it all. And it's uh, derived from an excerpt from a poem of Boris Pasternak, the Russian uh, um, author. And it goes something like this. For life is only an instant, the dissolving of oneself into the selves of all others, as if bestowing a gift. And 
that message was the message I hope to project in my trees. You'll notice that my trees don't have roots. And the reason for that is that I see them as halfway between life and death, uh, between earth and heaven, the heavens. Um, and so they are floating in, in space. Um, they are, are, are rootless. Um, the trees are, um, interesting to study in terms of uh, the materials that I use, once again, drawing from Japan. The paper is homemade kozo paper, and kozo is the mulberry tree in Japan, um, and the paper is ha handmade. The mulberry uh, bark is crushed, and you see little specks of it uh, here and there throughout the tree, the uh, drawing. And um, I like that that uh, texture because for me it it uh, presents the earth side of this dichotomy that that I'm dealing with. Um, the leaves of the tree are also kozo paper, but uh, the bark is ground up so fine that you don't see it. And they are more like a tissue paper. But when, when you examine them, um, you need to know that both the leaves and the background uh, did come from the same source. And then the charcoal drawing was my hand drawing uh, that was um, added uh, to, the, to the image. I hope that the viewer looking at this get, has the feeling of the fragility of the earth. Um, we are, it, we exist in this enormous, space that exists in other spaces. And uh, when you see uh, a, a long distance shot of the earth taken from space, you realize how very, very tiny it is. It is like a little blue marble. And uh, it looks as though uh, it could be crushed at any moment. And it's this sense of fragility that produces in us the, the feeling of nurturing it, taking care of it, being good stewards of it, finding the ways in which we can help it to grow and be healthy. Um, and that, that is the overall uh, purpose of, of uh, my work. It's the heart and soul of it. Next slide, please. And this is another um, spring, uh, uh, part of the spring um, section of, of the exhibit. Uh, it's one of the nests from the show, which Allison mentioned, from the forest. One day, Jerry and I, or Jerry, was walking alone in the woods, and he came across um, a wild turkey nest. Uh, now, wild turkeys do not build their nests in trees. They build them in the ground, and they scratch the leaves and the twigs and, and the brambles um, with their claws until they form a kind of of uh, indentation in the ground. And it's there that they lay their eggs. And they have an enormous number of eggs. The nest that Jerry found contained 15. So he rushed home to get me um, and took me back to see the nest. Um, and uh, it was so, so beautiful. There was not a single egg that was like another. And uh, they were all modeled with patterns of the browns and beiges of, and reds of the leaves that were in their surround. 
And uh, I was so excited. I knew again, here's another series. And uh, I sent Jerry back to the studio to get the camera. He also helped me immensely by taking very, very beautiful photographs, this being one of them. Um, I looked, started looking for forms or shapes that would define nest for me. And I settled on sections of tree trunks. Um, we would go out and look for fallen trees. We never cut a, a live tree down, but there were plenty of fallen trees from uh, rainstorms and floods and lightning um, that lay on the ground. And I had, I, I had an abundance of choice. Um, and so I would look for sections that we could um, saw out or dig out and I could take back to the studio and um, re reshape and reform the, the very fine little, little branches that you see on this are tree roots uh, from fallen trees. Uh, we would get great six foot circles of of uh, roots hanging out of a tree that had crashed to the ground. Um, often at night, uh, it, it would um, wake me up and I would wonder what it would look like when I saw it the next day. So uh, the eggs came last and I had quite a search for those. Um, I didn't feel quite talented enough to make an egg. Um, I found these in Italy. Um, I had, had tra uh, traveled up in Carrara in the area where Michelangelo got his marble and uh, ha had found in uh, artisan shops there um, marble eggs, but, but they, were, um, they were too heavy for my piece. Um, the marble is so opaque and so solid. Um, and it wasn't until I was down in central T Tuscany in a, the village of Volterra that I found alabaster eggs, which are so luminous and allow the sunlight to penetrate and reveal the, the life force inside the veins that exist inside uh, the the alabaster round. Next slide, please. And I believe this may be the last, uh, but actually it's the first. Uh, they, as Allison told you, were done in 1964. Uh, shortly after I had finished my studies with Paul Sample, and he had told me, now it's time for you to become professional. Um, I was so influenced for this series by the creeks that exist in Vermont. Vermont is a state of small watery creeks, um, each with thousands of beautiful patterns in them. And the winter ice, and the sun uh, reflecting and shining through that ice adds another thousand. Um, I had, had infinite choices and loved doing this series. I did not frame it. Um, and at that time, I, I wasn't very conscious of being archival. The, these were done on newsprint which is uh, you know, a very inexpensive and, um, and non-archival uh, paper. Um, I put them away in a portfolio and over the years moved them from home to home um, in my flat file. And uh, a couple of years ago, Kathy and my daughter, oldest daughter and I were cleaning out the flat file and we came across this, this portfolio. 
I couldn't even remember what was in them. And we opened it up and uh, there were seven of these, um, what for me are quite incredible drawings. Um, they're incredible for many ways. Uh, the seriality that Allison spoke of. Um, but the most important thing is that they're like a retrospective. I can look at these drawings and then look at my work through the years and I can see elements of this very early work that carried on throughout the years. Uh, and there were many of them. Uh, it's, it's so exciting to, to know that that central core, that, that heart and soul of my work is, is something that I believe came from very deep inside me um, and in a way was archetypal uh, and projected itself into the work um, year after year after year. And the example I find of that in this exhibit, uh, if you look at passages of, of color changes from light to dark and, and then from uh, a shades of blue, uh, multiple shades of blue or white uh, or gray, and you look at the eagles, you find the same thing happening in their wings and their bodies. Um, and, and yet they were done 25 years at least apart. Um, and, and that is very exciting. So I like to end with the fact that it all came together for me at the United Nations uh, one day in 1990. Um, 40 cosmonauts in, from the Eastern Bloc and, and 40 astronauts had been invited to appear in, to celebrate the holiday, uh, the Earth Day holiday. Um, and uh, they were up on a stage um, and uh, I was with, along with many other family members and the public were down in, um, I was down in the audience with simultaneous headsets. The astronauts and cosmonauts uh, had six of them selected um, and they were asked to talk about what they felt like and what they saw when they turned around and looked at the earth for the first time from outer space. And each astronaut was asked to address the audience in their own language. Now they did not have some simultaneous headsets on, so they didn't know what was being said unless they were multilingual. And, and we out in the audience could tell what they were saying. So when it was over, Jerry, came down the stage and into the audience to me and uh, my daughter and granddaughters who were also attending and said, what did they say? And I was crying. I said, Jerry, you're not gonna believe this, but they all said the same thing. They all described the earth as fragile, delicate, needing to be nurtured cared for, they used the word nurtured, they used cared for, they all said the same thing. And this kind of flies as far as, as perception is usually considered. It's usually um, thought of as a very individualistic thing and subject to the environment and how you are raised and that everyone sees something differently but they all said the same thing. And so it was a validation of my feeling that in our hearts as human beings, we have this place where we see the same thing. Uh, and I knew then again that I wanted to make a series, but I could not find the visual words. 
I tried everything and nothing was right. So finally, I put it in the back of my head and deep in my heart. And it wasn't until 20 years later when I moved to Vermont that the images began to come. And this is the very last image in the series. And it's titled, The Words Were All the Same. I hope you enjoyed um, uh, the exhibit. I hope it inspires you. Uh, and, and I hope that someday um, we meet and you can share your thoughts with me. Thank you again for visiting Southern Vermont Art Center and the Wilson Museum and Choices. Thank you so much, Pat. You are an incredible storyteller. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> really did are. I go, did I go over time? No, no, that was uh, um, about 40 minutes, I think, uh, with both my, my comments and um, your narration of each of the objects in the exhibition. Do you wanna, do you wanna take time for a few questions? Sure. Oh, wonderful. Uh, so the, the first question I had for you is, um, if you could tell us more about your artistic inspirations. You mentioned your deep and ongoing interest in ancient world cultures from Mesopotamia, from Egypt. You talked about uh, how impactful your travels to Japan were. Um, if you could sort of walk us through like the imaginary encyclopedic museum of your dreams, you know, what, what galleries would you head to first? What artists would you make sure to stop in and say hello to, um, you know, it, I think that would just be really interesting to know, um, you know, who, who, who has inspired you? Okay. Um... I have a bucket list and I did not get to all of them and I doubt that I'm going to make it uh, to some of them. Uh, Machu Picchu uh, being one and, and the plains of Nazca uh, above Peru in the mountains. I had a dream of Jerry flying me in an airplane over the plains of, of Nazca. Um, but I was fortunate enough to, to get to a lot of them. Um, where, where to start? Um, the reason I'm having trouble is that after um, maybe five or six years of, of visiting museums and seeing favorites, favorite things, I settled on Italy mm. and I particularly settled in Tuscany. And I, I got to Tuscany every year for about 20 years and, and could not leave. I knew I should get to the Hermitage, but I just couldn't quite do that. I could <laughs> not leave Tuscany. Um, I did see Stonehenge in England, which was a dream uh, and then uh, we did fly over that, and Jerry flew me in a helicopter over Stonehenge. And that was exciting uh, and beautiful and powerful. And then we visited Cornwall and looked up a, a lot, a lot of smaller stone circles. And then as I researched and studied, I found not only were they all over Scotland and, and Wales, uh, but they actually went way, way back in, in history um, in, into Mesopotamia. Um, I went to the Louvre and um, I love the um, winged victory of Samothrace and her thrusting into the skies, I mean, you, you could predict that one. <laughs> um, I went to the Brandenburg Gate in, in Berlin uh, and, and that was so unbelievably powerful and meaningful. 
Um, some of these obviously are not painters. Um, that comes in Italy. Um, I went to Dresden. Uh, we were with the cosmonauts um, and, and the astronauts uh, that uh, form the uh, Association of Space Explorers. And uh, we met every, every year in one of the astronaut or cosmonaut countries. And, um, and it, when, when we met in Berlin, it was the year after the wall had fallen. So we were able to combine both East and West Berlin. Um, and that's why we ended up in Dresden and what a powerful creative moment that was. Um, so um, uh, Austria, Spain, I love Go the Goyas uh, in particular. Um, I, Southern France and Northern Spain, we visited the prehistoric cave art, and that was a major, major one on my list. Mm -hmm. I was lucky enough uh, to be able to present uh, um, at least a master's <laughs> dissertation on why I should be allowed to see the cave art. Um, <laughs> you went through quite a process trying to, to let them vet you. Um, and, but I was accepted, and Jerry was accepted, and together uh, we we just had an indescribable experience of being in the presence of, of uh, that beautiful, beautiful art. Um, it was illuminated by a tiny light bulb, a bare bulb. Um, and as you went from, there were three caves at Lascaux that we explored as we went from room to room to room, they would turn the light out in the room that we left and turn the light on. And that was the point in time when they were just beginning to discover the damage that was being done to, to the art. Um, so as we left, finally, um, and they closed the last door just before it closed, the light flicked out and then the door shut. And I had this feeling that it had gone back to 15,000 years ago and, and um, was by itself again in the dark. Mm. It was just was wild. Um, so then, um, I ended up in Italy by way of loving Michelangelo's work um, and um, an artist that preceded him by about a hundred years, Luca Signorelli. Um, I had discovered his work in Orvieto in a cathedral in the 1960s and I'd, I'd done a lot of research and study of him. Uh, he was the first person to animate the human form and, 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 and to take it out of it, its rigid uh, pose that, that had existed since pre-Greeks um, and, and show the muscles moving. Uh, and, and what an interesting relationship it was to look at his work and remember the, the animated animals in Lascaux. Mm. And there the animation was done by using the bumps and lumps in the cave wall to form a, a shoulder or, or, or a, a hoof in, in motion. Um, so along the way, uh, we, we started living in the cities in, uh, mainly in Florence. And uh, along the way, Somehow or other, uh, I read that you you really don't know Italy until you've been in the country, lived in the country. So we decided one year that we would try it. And 
it was such an incredible experience. We found a little village on top of a hill. And of course, that's what Italy is, is a little village is on top of hills. And this one was about an hour south of Florence and uh, 45 minutes east of, um, east of Siena. Um, and um, maybe a half hour north of Arezzo. Um, so it was right in the heart of Tuscany and right on the edge of the Chianti region, which didn't hurt a bit. <laughs> and uh, uh, there in Arezzo, I discovered Piero della Francesca and fell in love with him and his work. Um, I have written a book about it, which the bookstore has, called uh, The Piero Affair with side trips. <laughs> and the Piero affair is um, my meeting of this incredible artist in these dark little churches and tiny little museums um, in this very small area of central Tuscany. Um, and, and there we meet and have our love affair. Um, and then, uh, the side trips are all the things that Jerry and I did in between. <laughs> <laughs> the villages we found, the little churches we found, the wonderful food, the lovely people, the, um, the, the lifestyle, the vineyards, the sun, the girasoles, which are the, the sunflowers that are so wonderful in the um, countryside. They wake up facing the east and they turn a little bit all day long until the end of the day they're facing the west. It was such, a, such an amazing thing. Um, we explored World War II Italy. Uh, we both had a tremendous interest in that history. And Italy has never forgotten that, that uh, the, the GI Joes uh, gave them their freedom. And, and the American soldier is so revered to this day and it's passed on from person to person in the family. Okay, that's a long answer to your question. Oh, that was wonderful. It's making me... Uh, get the travel itch. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, then the second question I had for you today, Pat, is, is really kind of digging into this idea of seriality or repetition that is so prevalent in your work. I was making note of um, all the pieces that, that came up during your talk that are part of series. So you talked about Ra is one of 35 pieces. Of course, there are the four sky dancers. Epilogue is part of 25. There's seven images in the Dogwood series. The Instant of It All has four pieces. Um, the Winterscapes have seven. Um, so, you know, could you, could you offer us some thoughts ab about this idea of repetition, what it does for you as an artist? and what impact you think it creates for the viewer. Uh, and then kind of a, a secondary question, it's a little bit about process. Do you, do you tend to start with a, a vision of the, the whole series or a series of connected works? Um, or does it kind of grow organically? You start with one and that leads to another and another and another. Um, so sort of a two-part question for you there. Um. The second part of that is easier to answer than the first part. So I'll answer it first. <laughs> uh, I um, almost never start with a finished idea. Uh, I, I mentioned that I studied with Paul Sample. One, one of the things that he said to me that I've carried along all of the years was, you know, it takes two people to paint a painting, one to do the painting and the other to tell them when to stop. <laughs> uh, so 
I always know when to stop. I hear that voice saying it's time to stop, and, and I do. I rarely ever go back and do more. The exception to that you have in the lobby, and that's the words were all the same. And that's because the Brattleboro Museum sort of commissioned, I mean, they asked me to do an outdoor piece, uh, which I did not have for our fragile home. And uh, I did that piece. But um, I, I, I just start with the inspiration, like seeing the tree outside the hotel and knowing I had to do a series on it. Uh, and then at some point in time, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the answer to that. Mm -hmm. The seriality I was uh, not aware of until uh, 1990, somewhere in the late 90s, I did an exhibit called the Texas Tour. And that was curated by Don Bacigalupi, um, who was uh, later at Toledo and then at Crystal Bridges as director. Uh, he had just finished his PhD at the University of Texas in Austin and uh, was um, sort of free and, and um, he later went to the Blaffer Gallery in, in uh, Houston. And um, uh, I needed a curator. And so I, I do this periodically <laughs> in my life. I called him. Um, I called Louise Bourgeois one day. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I asked him if he was would be able to do, do that. And Jerry, we had a little Mooney airplane and Jerry flew down to Austin and picked up, pardon me, picked Don up and brought him up to the property for the weekend. And he lived with the work and, and then made, made the decision that yes, he could do that. And, uh, uh, he wrote a gorgeous essay, and in it, he had quite a section on the seriality of my work. And I looked at that sentence and I said, Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just hadn't been aware of it. It was something that was happening. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and then I became aware of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, what can I bring to the, the viewer? That's kind of up to the viewer. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it may have relevance to them. Not everyone is a history buff like I am. And, and I think, of course, history presents the opportunity for that seriality. Um, and so for some people, it may not mean anything. Um, I like it that very much like the continuum message of, of the continuum exhibit. Um, it's astounding to me that in 1968, we were exert, exerting the same behaviors that we exist, exerted in uh, 600 uh, BC. People hunted people with dogs. Um, people beat people with clubs. People assassinated people in both, both times and in all time in between. Mm. People also loved people. <laughs> Right. Hmm. Well, now I have to ask, what was your call Louise Bourgeois about? <laughs> <laughs> I, when I was, um, let's see. How old was I? 
I think about 80, I decided there were some late octogenarians and then some that, that were in their 90s, uh, women uh, artists. And I, Louise Nevelson had passed. And I, I thought, I'll never get to talk to these people unless I try. Huh. And so I called Louise Bourgeois and her son answered the phone. Well, first of all, I looked in the phone book, the New York City phone book, and I was astounded that her number was listed. So I called and her son answered and I told him that I was an artist and I very much would love to be able to meet her. Was there any possibility of that? And he said, oh, yes, the mother entertains on Sunday. <laughs> you may come Sunday, but you must bring a portfolio uh -huh. and uh, be prepared to present. <laughs> and so I took another deep breath and said, well, I'm going to be in New York on Sunday. Would my three daughters, with my three daughters, would it be okay if I bring them? And he said, oh, certainly, Mother presents on Sunday. <laughs> so he gave me the address, and on Sunday at the appointed hour, we knocked on the door, and this little woman in a sort of a gunny sack, <laughs> it was the baggiest dress I've ever seen, answered the door, and she said, I'm, I'm Louise, who are you? And I told her, and she said, come in. And she took us to the back of this very dark hall, to this bare room. There was a small table and two chairs and a cot, an army cot. Mm. One of those things without a mattress. And she told the three girls to sit there. And she said, I'm gonna call you number one, two, and three, because I can't remember names. And so number one, when the doorbell rings, would you answer it? <laughs> and number two, you get me a glass of water from the kitchen. <laughs> and the girls were just, their jaws dropped. So um, I presented to her and she critiqued the work. She was very, very sexually, um, derivative everything that I did had a sexual interpretation uh, at that point I was showing her a series of a series of uh, large jugs with holes in the side of them mm -hmm. um, and after seeing two or three she said tell me what the holes are for <laughs> and, and I said they're to let the spirits in or out mm -hmm. and I, you know it was there right right away and I, I didn't have to think about it and she said oh well they look to me like punctures huh. or probing <laughs> and <laughs> my oldest daughter said uh and Ms. Bourgeois, mother took us to the Met yesterday to see uh, your sculpture, Eyes. And I'm curious, what what are the holes mean to you? <laughs> she had two eyeballs with the irises had, I mean, the pupils had little holes. <gasps> cut in them like the Greek statues. Uh -huh. <laughs> and she promptly went to sleep. Oh. <laughs> it was the funniest day I've ever spent. When I left, I said, can I come back? And she said, if you don't bore me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, that is... It was great. Absolutely yeah. great. She was wonderful. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, Pat. You definitely did not bore us today. Um. <laughs> I'm very glad. <laughs> I want to thank you again, Allison, for curating the show. You did a marvelous job. 
I, I love your sense of space and and the air uh, uh, to breathe around each work. And uh, I, I, I just thought it was perfect. And I thank you very much. You're very welcome. It's been such a pleasure and an honor to work with you. And I'm so glad we had a chance to have this conversation and that it will live on on our website um, so people can dip into your exhibition for years and years and years. So thank you for taking the time today, Pat. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.